you very much, Shay, and, and thanks everyone uh, attending virtually the talk. Um, and thanks everyone who has been participating in the supergroup. It has been a lot of fun. It's uh, an original initiative of Shay and Sean, I, if I remember correctly. But it's grown so much and we're all super happy and we, we hope that this you know, keeps developing and, and keeps growing. Um, anyway, it's, it's my turn now to present something. And uh, for this opportunity, I want to share with you some thoughts and results that I have on, uh, unsurprisingly, the fragment of classical logic that respects the variable chain principle. Um, it's going to be a fairly technical talk. Perhaps there will be some conceptual things to say. Um, I'm happy to, to announce that there are some interesting results and uh, more than anything, there are some interesting connections between the things that I'm going to present and some stuff that some people here in the audience have been working on, mainly ST logics, also wiki cleaning logics, uh, and three valued semantics for classical logics and whatnot. And so perhaps this will be of some interest in itself because of the technical facts, even though you might not be interested in the whole aim of the talk. Perhaps the, 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 the steps that I'm going to take to, to get there will be of interest to you. So uh, I will be happy with that anyway. Okay, good. Let's just start um, uh, for that. Um, so it's fairly obvious, but my aim here is to study this fragment of classical logic. And by this, I mean something very particular. And it's the formula to formula inferences of classical logic that respects the variable sharing property. So there is some overlap between the propositional variables of the premises and the conclusions. So this is the, the, the fragment of classical logic, the section, the portion of classical logic um, that I'm going to want to keep. I refer to this as the, you know, the, the heart of this super huge round cheese. Some people want to see it other way. Uh, I think that it's interesting, even though there might be some, some reasons to, 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 this, to, to not like this, uh, I think it, it, it is interesting. And, and I, I'll tell you why. So, so some people say, um, probably correctly, that uh, the variable chain principle is uh, insufficient. It's not sufficient for a characterization of relevance, um, but only necessary, right? And they actually, some of these people actually say that it's insufficient because it doesn't select you know, a set of relevant inferences. Um, and some people say it's, in, it's insufficient um, and only necessary because even though some inferences respect the variable sharing principle and they are valid, they are not relevant or they should not be regarded as something that a relevance logic should aim for, right? Um, here, I'm not very much interested in discussing exactly which is the way to go. But if you have some insight um, in this regard, um, I will be very happy to discuss it. Um, the whole thing that I'm going to be discussing here mainly stems from a technical and um, just a, an exercise that I wanted to, to, to do, where I just realized that I had the tools to characterize this fragment um, from my work in two independent things, so on non-transitive or you know, three valued semantics for classical logic, and also in infectious logics or weak cleaning uh, like uh, systems. Um, and I realized that they could be, you know, uh, put together to, to work um, uh, out the semantics for this system, for this fragment, and therefore I, I went for it. Um, but also from a conceptual point of view, if you think that the DSP is not sufficient but only necessary, you might think that perhaps, you know, you just need to add something more to get like a sufficient necessary and sufficient criteria for relevance and that could be for example you know truth preservation so basically the bsp is like a sieve that, that will allow you to you know just cut the things that you do not want from classical logic and keep you know uh, exactly the nice parts of it you might want to look at it at this way you may not want to look at it this, this way and we can discuss this of course in the q a um, but it's not, nothing is really, you know, um, dependent on these from the technical things I'm going to present. Okay. So let's, let's uh, go for that. So basically one thing that is interesting to me to, 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 to say here is that the fragment that I'm going to discuss he, uh, here, so 
uh, this fragment that I call CLBSP, basically the fragment of classical logic that respects the variable chain property, is also um, somewhat, somewhat interestingly the first degree intelligent fragment of relate, the relatedness logic presented by uh, Epstein uh, in a uh, book in the from the 90s, 95, if I remember correctly. So for some of you who might be familiar with that, uh, might be an interesting thing to look at. So basically the semantics and the calculus I'm going to give here are uh, semantics and a calculus for the first degree internal fragment of this uh, logic, from the uh, relevance logic. Okay, so, so, so let's talk about the satisfaction of the BSP. So um, there's, there's an interesting thing to, to think about, which is what, so what happens when you just impose or when you just look at the fragment of our task logic that respects the variable chain property, what, what do you actually get from, from that, uh, from, from this, you know, cutting and, and, and trimming uh, thing? So if the logic itself satisfies the variable chain property, trivially, you're not cutting anything because it, it already had the property, right? So, so basically, think one one example could be I don't know, let's, let's say Belknap Dan four value logics. So the, the first degree internet fragment of R, right, of, or of E, um, it's it, it's a task logic and it satisfies the VSP. If you just restrict it further, you're not doing anything. But what happens if it doesn't? So what happens if the logic is not relevant? Uh, for example, classical logic. Then the thing that you end up is not going to be a task logic but it's going to be a non-transitive system, right? Um, and basically, if either it has theorems or anti-theorems, so uh, logical contradictions or whatnot, then you're going to end up with a, a non-transitive system. And not only a non-transitive system, but more particularly a non-transitive P-logic. And uh, P-logics are basically um, task logics, which are not are logics which are monotonic and reflexive that do not necessarily satisfy uh, reflexivity. So basically, just go for a task logic and take away uh, the to take take uh, the, the the transitive part out. Okay. So <clears throat> we know that um, we know that task logics can be associated semantically with logical matrices. So basically, a pair of an algebra. In the uh, set of designated values, the filter, uh, how are you going to see it? So one interesting question, uh, you know, in, in, in a way, uh, building up to, to the more uh, uh, connected question is, which conditions on, on matrices guarantee the satisfaction of the variable chain uh, principle property uh, for the logic induced by these matrices? And there is some very nice uh, results by uh, Gemma Robles and Jesus Mendes. Um, which says basically that if the task and logic is induced by a logical matrix, um, here in algebra and here in set of designated elements, and basically you now the, 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 the logic has negation, conjunction, disjunction. Um, if these things are, are, are this way, so, so basically if uh, you, have a, um, you have a value which is designated and also it's a fixed point for, for all operations, and you have a value which is undesignated uh, as an fixed point for all operations, then the logic satisfies the variable chain property principle, right? So how to translate this for P logics? Because we are going to aim at P logics, right? So um, non-transitive P logics actually can be associated with uh, structures which generalize logical matrices. And these are uh, so-called uh, P matrices. Um, why do they generalize logical matrices? Because they have an algebra and they have two sets of uh, designated elements. One for premises, one for conclusions. If these are the same, then you get the regular logical matrices. But if these are different, you do not, right? And you only impose the constraint that the set of designated elements for premises should be included in the set of designated elements for conclusions, okay? So question is, how can we generalize these in order to also impose conditions for matrices to, 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 to satisfy the variable chain property for P matrices, right? So basically what we need is something which is not which is designated for premises. Uh, so a value which is designated for premises and is 
uh, fixed point for all operations. And we also need a value which is not designated for conclusions and also not designated for premises, um, which um, is also a fixed point of all operations. And if you have these, then your, your uh, logic satisfies the variation increase. Your P logic, that is, non transitive logic, logic satisfies the variation increase. So basically, two things um, one truth value, which is designated for premises and conclusions, which is a fixed point for all operations. One truth value, which is not designated for premises, not designated for conclusions, a uh, fixed point for all operations. Okay? This is sufficient condition for the satisfaction of the BSP. So, with these sort of tools in hand, I'm going to show you a two step strategy that I came up with. Uh, it might be some different strategies, some different alternatives, easier, simpler, uh, you know, mm, I know, better ones. But I'm going to discuss the one that uh, I uh, realized that was available here to end up with the semantics for the fragment of classical logic that respects the violation principle, you know, restricting to single formulas, as so single premises, single uh, conclusions, uh, just formula, formula, uh, fragment of that. What are we going to do? Two things, and, and, uh, and the first thing is going to, you know, uh, ring a bell for, for those uh, who are familiar with ST and the logics that Dave, Pablo, Paul, and some other people, um, uh, Robert, and some other people uh, were discussing in the last uh, decade or a couple of years. Um, so we're first going to need to find a proper P matrix for, for classical logic. What, what do I mean by that? We're going to find a P matrix, which is a proper P matrix. So these two sets of designated elements are not going to be the same set. So it's going to be a proper P matrix, not a regular matrix, right? So we're going to find a proper P matrix and spoiler, this is connected to ST and the ST literature because this is going to be a three value P matrix. Uh, as in the ST tree value semantics for classical logic. And then when we find that proper P matrix, we're going to actually extend this structure, which is a semantics for classical logic, to another structure in order to pin down exactly the fragment of classical logic that respects the violation principle. And we're going to do that by adding some additional truth values behaving exactly in the way which is sufficient uh, in order to satisfy the variable chain principle right so i'm going to show you exactly what i mean by that and we're going to need to pay attention and to be subtle in these steps but um hopefully um you will get exactly what uh, i'm doing and why i'm doing that so first of all a proper P matrix for classical logics can be arrived at in several ways. And actually, um, Bruno Darre, who is here present in the audience, I guess, uh, from Buenos Aires, and, and together with colleagues uh, from France, we're actually investigating all the ways in which you can give a P matrices for classical logics. But one of the ways in which you can do that is the ST way, right? So that you, you go for the strong cleaning matrices, strong cleaning truth tables, and um, you uh, arrange the set of designated uh, values accordingly, and you get the three value semantics for classical logic. It's a P matrix, right? This is not what I'm going to do here. And not only that, but doing, going the strong cleaning way will absolutely not work for the whole strategy that I'm going to deploy here. So it's essential that I'm going the way that I'm going uh, to tell you in one second, uh, which is not a strong cleaning, but a weak cleaning way, okay? So that is a side note for those involved with the ST literature and, 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 and who know some uh, bits about the semantics of the ST literature. So, so first of all, we're going to, to develop a proper P matrix, but it's just for classical logic. So all the inferences valued in this logic is, are going to be exactly those valued in classical logic, nothing more, nothing less. 
And we will do that by extending the two element Boolean algebra with one additional element. And that element is going to behave in an infectious way. What do I mean by that? It's going to behave as an all purpose zero element in a value in, value out fashion. It's going to, have, to act as an absorbing element for all operations as an annihilating element or however you want to call it. Okay. And this actually renders an algebraic structure which is called the weak cleaning algebra, right? And some of you may know it uh, from different bits of the logical and mathematical literature here and there. And with the help of this algebraic structure, we're going to build a P-matrix. <clears throat> um, and this P-matrix is going to have two different set of designated uh, values, one of them for premises, one of them for conclusions. For premises, we're going to have that all premises should be true. And um, for conclusions, we're going to have that all conclusions should be not false, right? So this is the key to the sort of ST or non-transitive uh, way of defining a logical consonant. And we'll call the logic coming uh, out of it weak ST for, for, for the, just the measure of like weak cleaning and ST sort of uh, approaches. Um, but it, 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 interestingly enough, it has the same validities than classical logic. For those involved with this literature, yeah, there are some meta-inferential, you know, funny things going on. Uh, but here, hey, we're only talking about the validities. So, you know, meta-inferences um, do not exist as far as we are concerned, or we're not paying attention to them, okay? So this is the first step. So we, we end up with the weekly interest tables. So we have the classical logic for true and false, just the usual Boolean thing. And then we have an infectious element and we throw in uh, this here. Uh, um, it's, it's a fixed point for all operations. And we end up with a P matrix. We have an algebra, a set of designated elements for uh, premises, set uh, of designated elements for conclusions. And we end up with a P matrix for classical logic. This means that it is a proper P structure, so to say, uh, it's not a regular uh, logical matrix for classical logic, it has the same set of valid inferences in classical logic. Interesting observation. I'm not going to talk about this um, more than just these two sentences, but hey, maybe some of you are interested by this or intrigued by this remark, so I'm just going to throw it away. Funny observation, if you do this, with any logic, you can actually have a P a matrix semantics for that logic, okay? So whatever logic you have, um, if you throw in an infectious element and build uh, the P matrix in this way, you end up with a logic having exactly the same validities than the previous system. So, and this is completely unrestricted, okay? Uh, of course, if, you, if, if your logic is induced by the intersection of logical matrices, um, you can do that for all the logical matrices involved. Uh, but if it's induced by only a single matrix, like you know LP, K3, FVE, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then this gives you a recipe to just uh, P matrix semantics, so non-transitive versions of your favorite logic. Okay, second step. Here is the crucial part. So the second step is that we're going to add two more elements to this weak cleany based, you know, P matrix for classical logic. And we were going to do that, you know, according to the results that we had before, uh, which, which, you know, sort of um, spelled out the details, some details which suffice for the satisfaction of the variable sharing principle in the context of, of a P matrix, right? So these details uh, said that you need to have a truth value which is designated for premises and conclusions, and which is a fixed point for all operations. And also it said that you need to have a truth value which is undesignated for premises and undesignated for conclusions, which is also a fixed point for all operations. And that is sufficient for the satisfaction of the variation principle. So we're going to try to do exactly that and the key thing is this last sentence here. So this last sentence says that we're going to try to do that 
as seamlessly as possible. And what do I mean exactly and, and technically and formally by that? What I mean is that you know, the addition of these two truth values should be efficient in um, getting rid or invalidating all of the inferences which do not share a propositional variables between premise and conclusion, but also should be um, sort of innocuous um, as regards the invalid, so as regards invalidating inferences which actually share premise and conclusions, right? Uh, share a propositional variable, uh, sorry, between premise and conclusion. So we, we need to extend the structure in a way which is not destructive, right? Just, just, just the exact uh, amount of, of uh, trimming, okay? Good, so we will do this in this way. So this is the structure that we're going to play with. Um, what, what do I do here? So we have here at the center of every one of these truth tables, we have the weak cleaning behavior, right? So we have this E, which is the weak cleaning value or weak cleaning like value. Truth and falsity are perfectly classical, nothing really funny is going on there. And we have two additional truth values. This one I call E1 and E2 or OE1, OE2, it doesn't really matter, okay? So these two truth values uh, play exactly the role that uh, we were supposed to, to get uh, from, the, from the lemma that we have before. So one of them is going to be designated for premises and for conclusions, and it's going to be a fixed point for all operations, okay? The other one is going to be undesignated for premises, undesignated for conclusions, and it's also going to be a fixed point of all the operations. But remember this sentence here, as seamlessly as possible. So this addition of, of, um, of uh, you know, additional truth values um, should be, you know, do we care very carefully, right? So here, this translates to the fact that whenever these truth values are you now conjugated with some of the truth values which are not themselves, they actually act as if they were not there, right? As if you know, operations were actually done in the smaller algebra. So this is sort of um, a, a formal translation of the fact that we needed to, to um, to just get the right amount of this algebraic, you know, behavior and not a bit more. Okay. So, so the P matrix is actually uh, the, the, so you have this algebra and the set of designated elements for premises are um, are truth and this additional element E one or O E one and then the for, for conclusions we have true O E one and and the, the original E. Okay. And this logic, we can call it however you want. They just give this technical name, but it's an extension of, of weakest T. I, I mean, I'm going to just tell you in just two slides that this is exactly what we're going for. This is the semantics for the fragment of classical logic that we were aiming for. Uh, the proof is fairly simple, but, but let me just mention to use some of the so, so some algebraic um, um, things that can be said uh, in relation to the, the behavior of these values, right? So um, here I'm going to say that an algebra has two distinct elements, um, k and ok, such that the second mimics the first, if and only if for all operations in the algebra. Uh, whenever OK is one of the inputs, um, then actually you can calculate um, the output of the operation as if you were replacing OK by the value K, right? So in a way, the result of plugging in one of these values is the result that you will have gotten if you were to plug the other, right? And you can actually do this for, you, have, you can have multiple mimicking elements, 
right? And this is exactly what we are getting here, right? So the O is for that, right? So we have a, a value which is mimicking the, the weak clinic truth value here, one here, and a value which is mimicking the truth value, uh, the weak clinic truth value also here. So two mimicking elements. So we have a structure which is based on the weak clinic uh, algebra, and then we have two mimicking elements which um, sort of mimic the weak clinic value. But oh, we can also look at, at this structure, uh, at the five value structure that I show you, as an extension of the weak clinic value, not only with, uh, of the weak clinic algebra, sorry, not only with these mimicking elements, but also with mimicking elements which are also, let's say, universally idempotent. So they are idempotent for all operations. And this is exactly why I chose this terminology, right? So it's the weak clinic algebra extended with two mimicking elements which mimic the or infectious uh, bit, uh, the infectious element, um, and which are also universally important, as now uh, suggested by the lemma that we had before for the satisfaction of the viral chain principle, right? Okay, so with this at hand, um, we arrive at the first result of the of the talk, which is that actually this semantics, so this structure gives you a semantics for the fragment of classical logic that respects the viral chain principle. And the proof is very simple. Um, we can discuss it in the Q&A if you want, but um, I'm not going to give you uh, here in full. Um, but it's not as difficult as, as one may, may, may think, okay? Good, so this is the first result. Um, and just, just, just like I said before, um, just one, one more you know, generalization here. So since you can also do, you can extend every well, task and logic that you have, the semantics for every task and logic that you have, with an infectious element and get a non-transitive version of that logic, you can then you know, apply this extension with mimicking elements to that structure and actually get the fragment of your logic that respects the variable chain principle. So here I'm focusing on these results just for classical logic. There's nothing, there's nothing here uh, which actually screams this only holds for classical logic. This actually holds for every task of logic that you want to focus on uh, if you have the, 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 the structures for that. Okay, let's go for the, for, the, for the calculus now. And this is not going to be uh, perhaps as um, weird as the previous uh, part. But anyways, um, hopefully it will be uh, of some interest. So, here um, we're going to to interpret this sequence um, in the following way. So, so as, as representing these these entailments in, in in related logic, or basically as representing the conjunction of all the things to the left and the disjunction of all the things to the right, holding in a valid inference in the fragment of classical logic that respects the variation principle. So. If we have a parallel sequence of this form, what we mean is the conjunction of all the phi's entails in classical logic the disjunctions of all the size, and also you know, this conjunction shares a propositional variable with this disjunction. Okay, the sequence calculus that we have here is very, very, very simple. We have a form of reflexivity for propositional variables with um, weakening to the left and right also in the axioms. We also have a cut, a restrictive version anyways, uh, which guarantees a satisfaction of the variable chain principle. Um, uh, we're going to show actually that this is eliminable, so it's actually not needed, but what we have it as a, as a primitive rule anyways. Uh, we have the operational rules. First of all, the, the, the less controversial ones, uh, conjunction to the left, conjunction to the right, absolutely fine. Um, Disjunction to the left, disjunction to the right, nothing funny going on. But the negation rules are actually restricted. So, um, in order to move negations to the left and to move negations to the right, 
you need to guarantee the satisfaction of the variable sharing principle. And you do that you know, with these sort of linguistic restrictions. And basically, these restrictions allow only for the forms of explosion which satisfy the variable sharing principle to hold, and for the forms of uh, disjunction, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, excluded middle that satisfy the um, variable sharing principle to hold, and related inferences, of course. Cool. So with these rules, uh, we can give an, well, easy, uh, anyway, straightforward completeness proof, which essentially relies on applying the technique of reduction trees and reduction rules. Well, well reduction rules are actually these rules that apply from bottom to top. Um, and you have to take into account the, the restrictions, of course, the linguistic restrictions uh, for, for each of these rules in order to, to hold them, uh, to apply it for the reduction rules. And uh, with this, we, you actually show that every sequence which is not provable has a contour model. Um, and you can do that in two, in two steps. You first look at the ones which do not reflect the value sharing principle. Um, and for those who have some sort of counterexamples and for the ones which respect the value sharing principle, sequence, then you have a classical counter model, and that's it. And since, you know, the, the completeness proof has no, um, you know, there's no cut involved in the construction of the reduction trees, uh, no, no, no reduction rule related to cut, then, you know, the completeness proof, if you have a, 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 a sequence which actually is provable, then it allows you to generate a cut-free proof of every provable sequence. And this means that you have a total elimination uh, for this uh, calculus. Okay. And so with this, I think I end. And this has been uh, semantics for the fragment of classical logic that respect the variable sharing principle. And also sequence calculus for the fragment of classical logic that respect the variable sharing principle. And I hope you have enjoyed it. Uh, a little bit at least. Thank you so much.